All right, I now have the, uh, do, I look, do I look cool? I now have the pleasure of introducing Lee Saunders, who is president of AFSCME and one of the country's leading advocate for public services and the men and women who provide them at a time when we need public servants and advocates for them more than ever. <laughs> Incidentally, yes, Lee received uh, the America, Campaign for America's Future Progressive Champion Award last year. And we're happy to have him back this year to present the same award to Lily Eskelson Garcia. Lee. Good evening, everybody. Was Senator Warren on fire or what? Are you fired up? All right. You know, last year I received the Progressive Champion Award. I humbly accepted it on behalf of the 1.6 million members of AFSCME who stand up every day for their rights and the vital services they provide. Lily Eskelson Garcia was a presenter. She said a lot of nice things about me. Some of you were there when she was saying those nice things. Only a few of them were true, okay? So this year, I get to introduce Lily, my partner, the first Latina to be president of the three million member National Education Association. All right. Now I've known, I've known Lily for several years. She's my very good friend and a true partner in the progressive movement. Lily constantly states that, and I quote, as adults, we must ensure that regardless of their zip code, all of our students, all our students are prepared to succeed in life, end quote. Lily doesn't begrudge the children who have the best teachers, the best schools, and the most resources. She only demands the same for our, all children because they are all our children, aren't they? All of them. Now, I first got to know Lily a few years ago, before she was president. I've come to know that she has always been, first and foremost, an educator. Now, even, some of you may not know this, but even as a lunch lady, straight out of high school a long, long time ago, a long time ago, in a galaxy so far, far away. That galaxy was the state of Utah, where she was a lunch lady. Now maybe it's her upbringing in what is called the, the Beehive State. What a nickname, huh? Beehive State, okay. But that makes her a little bit unconventional. I mean, who but Lily would make a speech one minute and then break into a folk song the next? And if you have not heard this sister's voice, you are missing something. I'm getting ready to put her on one of the TV shows so we can make a little bit of dough, you know? We can, we can always use a little bit of that. But one thing has always been consistent, consistent about Lily. Her work is her calling. She'll go to extraordinary lengths to make the case for public education whenever, whenever, and however she can. Lily was named Utah's Teacher of the Year in 1989. She was determined to use the spotlight, use that spotlight for good. At a rally protesting school overcrowding, she talked about the cynicism of politicians who cried poor when funding public schools, but became Santa Claus when granting tax breaks. Lily was eloquent. Lily was uplifting. She was smiling. Then she called the governor stupid. <laughs> well, not in those exact words, but in Lily's own way, in a very nice way. But he got the message. And unfortunately, Lily hasn't been back to that state capitol since. <laughs> now, we want to move forward, fast forward 25 years. Lily had just become NEA president. She appeared on Morning Joe. Now, Joe was pontificating on education reform. 
Lily was eloquent. She was uplifting. She was smiling. Then she called Joe stupid. I mean, not in those exact words, but he got what she was meaning. And she hasn't been on Morning Joe since then. You got to cut this out, Lily. You really do. When Lily's talking, you always get the message. This is a great gift to the labor movement, to our progressive causes, to lead and speak with passion, forcefulness, and joy, to call attention to the facts, not with rancor, not with hostility, but with determination and with grace. And most importantly, to engage everyone, everyone, whether they are people with whom she disagrees or her members, not by speaking to them, but speaking with them. And I have seen her do that day in and day out. A few weeks ago, Lily came to a big AFSCME conference in Indianapolis. We had about 600, 700 women at that women's conference, where she was a panelist with Mary Kay Henry, president of the SEIU, Randy Gar Weingarten, president of AFT. Lily was authentic. She was inspiring, as she always is. But she said something that got me a little worried. Here's what she said, and I quote, you know, and then she started doing this, you know, one out of every 100 Americans is a member of NEA. And she looked around the crowd and she smiled. She said it again, one out of 100. So I thought to myself, aha, this is really and truly Lily's plan, world domination. <laughs> She'll probably repeat that tonight when she's accepting this award. So maybe that's why she's always blogging and writing and speaking before audiences of all, of all kinds, preaching and teaching and singing. Maybe it's just that she's on a mission. She's on a mission to change the way we think about teaching and learning, and to ensure that educators get the thanks they deserve for doing the hardest work that there is. So I am proud. I am proud to stand with my sister, with my partner, with my friend tonight. I'm, I'm proud to stand with her on the front lines every single day for her willingness to tell the truth and shame the devil, belief in fairness and equity for working families, and commitment to education and progressive values. Lily Eskelson Garcia, my friend, my sister, my partner, it is my honor to present you with the Progressive Champion Award. Teachers come to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. They're the ones who's coming up, and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children to jump the very best. Oh my Lord, I am so impressed with myself. <laughs> and what you don't know because he's so shy and he's so modest is that Randy and Mary Kay and I, while we were on that stage at the AFSCME Women's Conference, voted an electedly an honorary woman. Yeah. The plaque is now being engraved. There is... Um, there's an old saying in Latin America, dime con quien andas y te daré quien eres. Tell me who you hang around with and I'll tell you who you are. Moms say it to their kids, you know, like don't hang around with the wrong, wrong kids. I hang around with Lee Saunders. I hang around with you. I hang around with the cool kids. And this is, this is an enormous, enormous, um, honor. You have no idea. I am at my core. I will always be a sixth grade teacher from Utah. I, I, l let me tell you, someone once misunderstood me and thought that I was saying that to be humble. I'm saying it to be the opposite. I am a freaking sixth grade teacher from Utah. Fear me. Fear me. 
I have managed 39 12-year-old sweaty little suckers coming in after recess, after lunch in a 90-degree classroom with no air conditioning, and we organized a Shakespeare play for fun. Do not mess with me. There is nothing you can do to intimidate a teacher. You cannot frighten us. You can frustrate us. And I will tell you, we have been frustrated. It does frustrate us that there are so many people, I have to tell you, on both sides of the aisle, that think there are just simple silver bullet kinds of things that you can do uh, to make sure all kids have a quality education. 52 million very diverse uh, public school students, and there are powerful people who are serious when they say, you know, why don't we just privatize our public schools? Why don't we just standardize everything in a little textbook? Why don't we just deprofessionalize? I mean, how hard could it be? We just take people off the street and hand them a script and tell them that that's what education looks like. It's frustrating to us because people honestly believe it's possible that all kids can be above average. <laughs> and that it's possible that you can have a fabulous public school system and it won't cost any money. And it's possible to transform schools and we can do it the day after tomorrow. Because truly, all things are possible to people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, and I run into these people all the time. I live in airports now. That's where I vote. I can actually vote in the Atlanta airport. Um, and I, I will go anywhere. I will go anywhere where someone wants to talk about real education transformation, real empowerment of educators, real supports for the opportunities for all kids to learn. I was sitting on an airplane and the nice talkative man in the middle seat, if I think someone is talkative, oh my God, they're so talkative. And he's telling me where he's going and what he's doing and what his business is. And he says, so what do you do, darling? And I said, well, I'm a teacher. And now I work with the National Education Association. And he stopped smiling. <laughs> and he said, I've heard about you people. He said, I hear you need this, and then I hear you need that, and then I hear you need something else. And to tell you the truth, darling, I'm getting tired of hearing it. I'm a businessman. I want you to bottom line it for me. I want you to tell me right now, what is the one single thing that would solve all of our problems in public schools. And I said, that's easy. What we really need are fewer people who think there's one single thing that would solve all of our problems in public schools. And you know, I wish I hadn't been so snotty to that guy, but it was fun. And here's the thing, he's not the enemy. Most people, their kids are grown and gone or they never had kids. They don't walk into a neighborhood public school. The only thing they know about public schools are what they see on the 6 o'clock news. So if someone brought a gun to school, if there's a picket sign, that's on the 6 o'clock news. They think that's a typical school. I'm an educator. It's up to me to educate the man in the middle seat as much as to educate a politician about what happens in any given typical school on any given typical day. I mean, we serve kids a hot meal. We put Band-Aids on boo-boos. We diversify our curriculum and instruction to meet the personal and individual needs of all of our students, the blind, the hearing impaired, the physically challenged, the gifted and talented, the chronically tarted, and the medically annoying. We make sure that they've had their immunizations, make sure they understand disease control, teach them to resist drugs, alcohol, tobacco. We give career counseling, pregnancy counseling, mental health counseling. We get them on the bus safely. We take them off the bus safely. We provide computer instruction, sex education. We stop bullying, teach them to say, I'm sorry, and mean it. We instill an understanding of civil rights, the political process, challenge racism, foster social tolerance. 
tolerance and appreciation for our cultural and religious diversity. We teach the principles of free enterprise how to be a good sport. We develop personal responsibility, practice bicycle safety, and check for head lice. We provide bilingual education, teach metrics how to be a wise consumer, exercise weight control, how to drive a car. We teach the impact of wars, develop collaborative skills, how to tune a violin, how to use reason and evidence to protect the future. We teach them to revere their environment, how to manage their money, how to access information, how to make wise choices, how to balance a checkbook. We teach loyalty to the ideals of a democracy. We build patriotism, good oral hygiene, a respect for the worth and dignity of every individual. We nurture curiosity, encourage a good question, build self-esteem, and then we teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the 14 new things that someone will add to that list tomorrow. And you know what? We'll do it. We'll do it. We wouldn't take one thing off that list. We'll do whatever our students need. I've taught the most amazing students in a 20-year career on planet Utah. And I will tell you, that what they need doesn't come in a box. It doesn't come in one size fits all. I taught homeless children at the Salt Lake Homeless Shelter. And my kids needed to go to the dentist before I could teach them to sing their ABCs. I needed to be able to fill their little bellies before we could get into reading, writing, and arithmetic. I also taught in the suburbs of Salt Lake City in a nice, middle-class neighborhood where diversity means you found a Presbyterian. <laughs> and without a black or brown face in my sixth grade class at Orchard Elementary, what those kids needed wasn't in my social studies textbook, which had a little excerpt of Martin Luther King and his um, I Have a Dream speech with no context as to why he needed to talk about this as a dream. And so I got a bootleg copy of Eyes on the Prize. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I had my kids learn about lunch counter sit-ins. We sang protest songs. I wanted them to understand that Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King are not African-American heroes. They are American-American heroes. <laughs> And from preschool to graduate school, my colleagues, three million members of the National Education Association that elected me to be their voice, we see what we do as a labor of love. Do not mistake me. There is nothing sentimental, anemic, about a teacher's love for her students. Those those teachers that say, oh, I just love those darling little boys and girls. Those teachers are eaten alive by second graders on the third grade school. <laughs> Their pictures end up on milk cartons, and we never see them again. <laughs> teachers like me love our kids enough to fight for them, to fight for the whole blessed child, critical, creative thinking skills, cre creative, collaborative skills. We fight for their healthy bodies, which sometimes means a school breakfast. Sometimes it means sending kids home with a backpack on the weekends with some food that they can actually share with their families. We care about their ethical, compassionate character. And we take the power that we have inside that classroom, the power to open a child's mind to its infinite possibilities. And sometimes we take it to the streets and we take that collective power and we put it together in this thing called a union where these modestly paid educators, the teachers, the bus drivers, the, the, the lunch ladies can come together and say, you know, the, government, the governor doesn't listen to me when I write him a letter. But when we are a union and we march on Capitol Hill, they can't help but ignore, they must not ignore us. They can't help but hear us. We know where our power comes from. It comes from our not so humble hearts, knowing that the work we do is the future 
of everything. Everything. We know the mission, and it's written across our hearts, the mission of a public school educator. Give me your hungry children, your sick children, your homeless, your abused children. Give me your children who need love as badly as they need learning. Give me your kids who have talents and gifts and skills, and give me those who have none. Whatever form they come in, whatever language they speak, whatever color their skin, wherever they find God, give them all to me. And the people in this public school will give you, the doctors and the engineers and the carpenters, will give you the ministers and the lawyers and the teachers of tomorrow will give you the mothers and the fathers and the thinkers and the builders and the artists and the dreamers. We will give you the American dream on behalf of my colleagues, the educators of America. I humbly accept this amazing award. Thank you for recognizing the importance of an American public school. Mil gracias, mis amigos, mi hermanos y hermanas. Gracias de mi corazón.